we're picking up here on lecture number one. This is part two. And doing a brief review of where we ended up with part one, that being with Andy Warhol, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and the idea of appropriation and graffiti. Again, recall that this overview incorporates some elements of our lecture guide number one images and the artwork that you're studying in our assigned text. This overview in week one is meant to provide a trajectory of how some of the historical images we'll be studying, for instance, relate to more modern and contemporary ones. So this overview is incorporating a cherry picking of the work that we'll cover this semester. And when we review lecture number two as part of week one, that will be when we start with a chronological narrative of the art that we're studying period by period. Returning to Andy Warhol, Warhol's brilliance was, in one way, showing us to ourselves as both consumers, as products of, as well as agents and tools of consumer commodification. Warhol's skull, which is two images down, provides a classic pattern for him. It's a grid of multiple, slightly varied images occurring well before Damien Hirst's skull, which is the diamond encrusted one, Basquiat and other contemporary artists. How graffiti migrated, we can see signs or semiology, semiology is the study of signs, as following a trajectory that perhaps can be traced from, let's say, cave paintings to subway cars, to the canvases of Basquiat and others. So that graffiti in this context becomes a common derivative appropriated element. Here and in the exhibition image above, we're seeing Andy Warhol's iconic, famous Campbell soup cans. Warhol is perhaps the most emblematic artist of the pop artist movement. Pop artists embraced the frank naturalism and mass media imagery despised by the abstract expressionists during the modern art period that we will study later on. Pop artists were engaged in a simultaneous critique of the pretensions of high art and the empty materialism of consumer culture, once again referencing something that is classically Warhol. One of the most persistent divisions maintained by art history, high art history in the canon, is this distinction between that idea of high or fine art and popular forms of visual expression. The pop artists and other modern to contemporary artists have alternately confirmed and rejected these categories. There is also the category of vernacular or outside of art that we will get to shortly. Here we see Andy Warhol's version of skulls. The image above this is Damien Hirst, just as reference. What you see here is a classic Warhol representation of a grid of the same image, slightly varied. Warhol, again, is the artist who more than any other stands for pop in the public imagination through a variety of media, underground movies, paintings, objects. As is the case with several others associated with pop, Warhol was a successful commercial artist first. Initially, like Roy Lichtenstein, he made paintings based on popular comic strips, but he soon began to concentrate on subjects derived from advertising and commercial products. Ergo, the Coca-Cola bottle, the Campbell soup can, and Brillo cartons. His most characteristic manner was repetition, as I said, within a grid. We can see that in the exhibition image. He showed us endless rows of Coca-Cola bottles or Campbell soup cans literally presented and arranged as they might be on supermarket shelves or an assembly line. Warhol, in fact, very appropriately dubbed his studio the factory. One of his 
best known quotes perhaps is this, quote, you can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola and you can know that the president drinks Coke. Liz Taylor, who was a famous actress at the time, Elizabeth Taylor, drinks Coke. And just think, you can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. What is this democratization of art occurring here? Here again, a quick review of where we ended up in part one, graffiti's first major step into the fine art world, which came with a landmark show called New York, New Wave, an exhibition that opened at the museum MoMA, Museum of Modern Arts um, adjunct facility, PS1, February 1981. It placed works by up and coming Jean-Michel Basquiat, which is in the second image down here, along major artists at that time, such as Andy Warhol. What are we looking at? Andy Warhol's appropriation of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Leonardo is a more common reference to the famous Leonardo da Vinci, uh, by the way. So whenever we hear Leonardo throughout the course, we will inevitably be, be referring to Leonardo da Vinci. So it's Leonardo, more common usage, as opposed to da Vinci. How does Andy Warhol do this? He plasters this famous iconic image, The Last Supper, the biblical story, of Jesus sitting at his last supper with his disciples, including Judas, the disciple, the apostle who betrays him. And he plasters it with corporate logos, Dove Soap, General Electric, GE. What is he commenting on in our culture by this example of appropriation? Below this is Leonardo's original The Last Supper and below that, the original contextualization. Andy Warhol made multiples of this version of The Last Supper, as I have referenced, um, as a representative element of his art practice. He made some hundred, more or less. This date would be 1986. 22 of these images out of the hundred were once exhibited in a church right across from the original church where Leonardo's Last Supper, which was made sometime between 1495 and 1498, once hung. In thinking about appropriation, it's important to recall that identity and artworks have identities too isn't something that already exists and is finite. It transcends place, time, history, and culture. Cultural identities come from a, an origin history, but like everything else that is historical, they under, and artworks undergo constant transformation. The eye of the moment beholding an artwork and evaluating it according to current contemporary ideas, topical concerns, bestow upon it a different identity that it possessed in an earlier time and will possess in the future. So far from being eternally fixed in some sort of a concretized finite past, they're subject to the continuous play of history, culture, and power. We're looking here at what is known as the quilts of Guise Bend. When I first saw these quilts in an exhibition at the Whitney Museum in New York, I was so impressed with them, with their formal vivacity or liveliness, um, with their sensitive use of color, and the immediacy 
of their physicality and the way that all those qualities evoked some sort of connection with the makers of these quilts. And you might ask yourself looking at this and reading the text above it, how did these quilts get there? I found myself questioning that and wondering how in the context of Western high art, such work by artists who were untrained and uneducated, but still clearly artists nonetheless, could be even more perhaps impactful than some or even much contemporary Western artwork. My questioning took me to the catalog, the book that accompanied this exhibition, in which the curators took great pains, it was clear, to place their quilt in the original context, which is a rural Alabama community of Gee's Bend. So every aspect of the lives of these quilters was described in detail. The history of the community, its spirituality, economics, politics, as well as it's now through this exhibition to a wider public, it's now famous quilt making tradition, a tradition that had been persisting and existing for far longer um, than the viewers of this exhibition at the Whitney would have known about, would have imagined. So this tradition had been happening for, um, had been occurring for a very long time. Suddenly, we think about the way we look at vernacular work when it is elevated, quote unquote, to this podium, this platform through being exhi exhibited at one of the country's most famous Western art museums, albeit one that shows primarily avant-garde, modern to contemporary Western art. So that can also lead us to, if we're thinking about this quilt within the idea of appropriation, it's not being appropriated as a practice here, although there are many contemporary artists working with quilt making and returning, not just through the DIY movement, but returning through craft and art to working with more traditional medias such as quilting and other ways of creating textiles. If this quilt is not appropriated, how can we also understand it contextually by thinking about how Western analysis or art critical theory is imposed on it when it possesses no links to the history of that critical theory. It's a different way of thinking about the narrative of vernacular art um, within its own tradition, and then as it's repositioned into a different category here of Western art in, again, a leading museum. The painter Mark Rothko's work belongs to one of two sections within the larger abstract expressionist movement. This is something we will get to much later on when we arrive at 20th century modern art. Abstract expressionism is often referred to as just abex, as a nickname, let's say, and those two divisions of it, sections of it, consist of color field painters and action painters. Jackson Pollock is one of the best known action painters. Again, we'll get to him later as well. Mark Rothko, a color field painter. Rothko himself, however, wouldn't always perhaps place his work within the context of abstract expressionism, although it does fit the physical presentation of his images. The best way maybe to describe a Rothko painting is to describe it physically in terms of its texture, its color, its composition. Rothko painted uh, with very thin paint. Um, he would greatly dilute paint either through turpentine or some kind of a solvent so that the overall finish to his work um, looks almost like a watercolor as opposed to a denser, um, thicker application of oil paints. They have more of a thin, washy appearance. 
And this ties in very much with the way that Rothko's paintings represent. They're not about texture at all. They're all about color and the rather meditative qualities of color that are attained through this intensifying of color by referring to it um, as saturation. Rothko generally uses three, maybe four hues or colors in a painting. Um, in many of them, he uses a combination of what we would call warm and cool colors together. Warm colors have a bit more energy um, and they seem to project more into the background and cool colors look as if they are receding a bit into the background. But again, it's the overall meditative properties of what these large canvases with their very uniform, um, often serene looking blocks of colors provide that makes Rothko one of the more classic of the color field painters. Um, we will return to Rothko later on as well as several of his contemporaries. In thinking about the pictorial expression um, and the calligraphic patterns of these beautiful carpets shown above, I thought of the work of a contemporary German-born San Francisco-based photographer who picks up on this same idea of curving, winding lines and incorporates them into his landscapes. This artist, who is a photographer, Thomas Heinzer, again, San Francisco-based German-born, is a master of creating aerial landscapes of the Bay Area. These were taken over the Cargill salt flats that uh, are in the vicinity of the San Francisco airport. And again, we can see this relationship between these contemporary photographs and these beautiful traditional carpet gospel pages shown above it. So we've said that Jan van Eyck was an innovative painter in his use of subject matter. And this is certainly demonstrated in this Arnolfini wedding portrait. This was painted at a time when private portraits were still rare. Um, van Eyck here is depicted an Italian merchant, Arnolfini, and his wife, one conjecture, standing in a bedchamber. Uh, this painting has been a source of much interest and research. It's thought to be a, a visual document attesting to the marriage it represents, and thus it's full of symbolic objects with distinct iconographies or meanings. What does the dog represent? The dog connotes faithfulness. What do the removed shoes imply? that the space is hallowed ground, sacred ground perhaps. And the mirror on the back wall, it is thought signifies the purity of the young bride. The artist's own reflection, Van Eyck's own reflection in that mirror, like his signature on the wall above it. If we look at the detail of the mirror in the image below, indicates that Van Eyck is serving as some sort of a witness to this ceremony. ceremony. Um, again, I mentioned that this image is, this painting is an object of much research. Some people agree that it depicts um, a wedding ceremony or an engagement ceremony, and others think that it was a memorial um, after the death of Arnolfini's wife. What do you think? Consider the way the figures are depicted, the various symbols in the painting. What do you think is its subject? Is this commercial appropriation? Is this appropriation in the form of an artwork? This is an ad that depicts the mirror in Arnold Finney's portrait, to which, thankfully, it's correctly attributed 
um, in the service of selling some um, charming little Christmas baubles. What does Madonna of the Goldfinch represent? In general, during this time, birds were thought to represent the soul in Christian art. We see here too, John the Baptist depicted showing a finch, a goldfinch to Jesus as a sign of his future crucifixion. Iconography and iconology are two terms that you'll come across in your readings um, and in these lectures. Iconology is a way of using social, political, religious representations of a time as, as a lens through which to contextualize an object in art history. If we look at the clothing, the postures, the objects in a room, like Jan van Eyck's mirror in the Arnolfini portrait, we can understand the meaning that the artist is injecting into their composition more clearly. This crucifixion scene is painted on oak panels. What does that mean to us? It means that through the practice of dendrochronology, which is a way of dating anything, including an oil painting on wood or made with wood, to its original age through measuring the growth rings in tree trunks in the wood itself that we are able to arrive at a fairly accurate understanding that places this crucifixion on oil panels um, as being made at the end of the artist's career around 1460, much more so than we would be able to if it had been painted on another type of material such as canvas. So dendrochronology is a largely accurate way of being able to date artworks that were created upon wood.